your handprint is also your fingerprints. Okay. They got mine already somewhere. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Greg. Hey, Jim, can you um, send me your personal email? Uh, I've got some information about balance for you. And there's something happened to my computer screen and I can't see anything. Send me your personal email. Uh, I've got some information about balance. You also have. And there's something happened to my computer screen. Yeah. And you you have another microphone on or another. Yeah, Greg, you on. have. Yeah, Greg, you have two microphones on. And that may be why you were having a problem on the one that you're on as far as viewing. Have another microphone on or another yeah, it's better if you mute yourself. Microphone. Great. And that may be why you were having a problem on the one on the oh, I'm still here. That's a long it's, delay. It's not him. I'm still Somebody hearing else it. Yeah, I'm still Somebody hearing else. it. Better yeah. if you mute yourself. Microphone. Ron, it might be you because you were highlighted. Some of the problems come because you haven't totally signed out yeah. on Zoom. That's a very long delay. You. Oh, it's me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it's you. When I started the live stream, it uh, it came up. That's uh, that's the, that's the problem. Sorry, Greg. Uh, let's unmute. Uh, you can unmute. Let's see. It's it's my fault. Um, will you forgive me? Unmute yourself. Hit the space bar. You got a Mac Pro. What are you doing with a Mac Pro? Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Greg. Is that even better? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you now. Yeah. Well, I can't see anything. Uh, all I got is launch a meeting. Well, your meeting is launched. Doing all, oh, you're on a Mac? Yeah, I'm just going to get out and come back in. All right. It's probably there. It's probably hidden, but I don't know how you'd bring it forward in the Mac. Sometimes I've run into a problem because I haven't totally logged out of the Zoom program. Usually just minimizing it. Yeah. Hey, Jim, Jim, what I want you to do is email me your personal email address. I have some information about balance for you. Okay. Can you do that? Let's see. I have trouble seeing who's who's talking. Greg Farrell. It's listed as Mac Pro. You're okay. on here, right? Uh, Greg, why don't you put put your email in the chat room, and I'll send it to my. I've, I've sent you an email already, and I don't know if it's got in there or not. In the chat room. Yeah. Let me look. Well, there's a there's a message, but no no email. Well, I sent you an email saying put your email in and give it to me so I can email you some information. How could you send him an email asking for Not an email, email a message? A message. Well, I just did over chat. Anyway, how's everybody doing today? Did you get a Mac? Well, I've had this Mac for a couple of years. Oh, I thought you were a PC guy. Well, I am. I got my PC up, but I was having problems with it. So I ended up buying a new, a whole new computer here. Oh, okay. You know, I think it was in February. So I couldn't let you guys get any, have anything better than me. So I had to get one up on you. But now <laughs> it's, it's a secondhand type stuff. Yeah. There you go. Hey, is the snow off the fields? What's happening over in your neck of the woods? No, oh, it was 82 degrees yesterday here. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. It's 72 right now. There you go. You know, the mountains have got quite a bit of snow on them, but uh, not down here on the valley floor. All right. There you go. Is Mike Ungerman here yet? Did Mike come nope. in? Nope. Mike he maybe. I think he's traveling. Oh, is he? 
with my luck, he won't show up today, right? <laughs> Maybe he's listening on his on his car radio or something. Maybe he's sort of listening to us as he's traveling. We will see. <laughs> I will be another uh, source my... for proton mail. Will be John Kennedy. If you can, you might want to send him an email. Yeah, I don't have his email address. Uh, J Kennedy at apcug dot org. Oh, good. Got it. Thank you. Does John use uh, Proton Mail as well? Yes. Ah, okay. Very good. Work fine, except it has a few little glitches I have to figure out. You can't, you can't just copy and paste into the body of an email. It won't oh. do it with right click. You have to do it with Control V. I found that out, but I have not figured out how to do a group mail yet. How to how to put that together? Control C to copy and Control V to insert. Yeah, but it won't insert unless you do control V. Usually I do copy right. and paste, you know, with yeah. the right click. So yeah, I figured that out, but I don't know how to do the group mail yet. So yeah, it, I, I used Gmail this last time because it made me crazy. And in Gmail, I just I just copy and paste the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Excel from the Excel worksheet, the, the right. addresses, and just copy and paste them in there, and that's no problem. Does not work with Proton Mail. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I wonder they have a free and um, paid version, right? I'm with the paid version. Oh, so you should have all the whistle and some bells. You should think. Uh, yeah, actually, there's three. I don't have a real professional, but I have the plus version. The other one is too limiting for me. So yeah. Uh -huh. Well, well, we'll see what John says or Mike says. <laughs> Thank you. I just did a quick uh, Google and I just put the link in. Thank you. I will copy that. It's control C, Anne-Marie. I know. <laughs> that goes back to my word star on my Osborne days. That's where I learned yep. that. I don't know that. Did you have one of the portables with the little screen? Oh yeah, that was the only the only Osborne, and they and they ended up going bankrupt because they announced a new model too soon, and everybody stopped buying it, waiting for the new model, which never came. Do you know why they use Control V for paste? Yeah, Control C and Control V. Right. Yeah, do you know why it's V though? He is the insert. Yeah, do you know why? No. Well, when it was paper and pencil time, and there was a word missing, and you wanted to insert a word on paper with you did pencil, a little, you yeah. put a little B in there, and then the word in there. That's why it's control V. I always thought it was because V is next to the letter C on the keyboard, and therefore that's why it's easy to remember. No. There you go. I'm surprised was, Huey can remember that far back. I can't. <laughs> I always was, thought it was because the yesterday? P was taken. That was my, the Osborne was my third computer. Oh. Yeah, I started with a Sinclair. Yep. I started with a Commodore PET and then a, a Radio Shack TRS-80. Did anybody have a K Pro? No, some people I, in our Osborne group did. I had heard of them. I go back. That was my first one. It was portable, like a sewing machine. Yeah, it was like the Osborne's. It was a, yeah. an Osborne knockoff, and it also ran CPM. And, oh. it, and a lot of things were you could use with the K Pro from Osborne and vice versa. I go back to the Altar 8800. Then the 8800B. Oh, those were the early Microsoft ones. Yeah, great boat anchors. Oh, as you can <laughs> see, my first computer was an Atari. Atari computer. But I had a time like Sinclair before that. And, and Neil, we still have your um, Osborne at the club. Yeah. Well, why, why isn't somebody using it? Well, it's just kind of uh, for um, display. I, I, it, I, 
Yeah, I'm wondering if that's the one I modified and put it a is. fan in the back of it. It is. It's the one you modify with fans in the back. Mm -hmm. I think I still have my floppy disks for. I started I out with a Commodore. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, I had a mighty my computer board. I think it was $99, and you accessed it. I had to access it with a uh, HP portable uh, uh, terminal that had a cup, you know, for a handset for uh, you put uh, a phone into it. And yeah. uh, you had 1K of memory, and I remember you could write a program for the hangman. Oh. Uh -oh. Well, my next computer was a, a Commodore. What was it? I had the 64, but before the 64, was it a 16 Vic, or something? Vic 20. Oh, 20. Vic, 20. Vic, Vic 20. Vic 20. Vic 20. There was no 32. Yeah, Vic 20. 20. 20. With I love the of RAM. Yep. I love the 64. And then after that, I bought a clone, I, you know, IBM clone. And at those times, you had two choices of software, either CPM based or Microsoft, I think and for the OS. And I remember I still have the receipt with the printer. I paid $3,800 for 10 meg of memory. And I think it had a uh, 20 megabyte hard drive. Ah, those were the days. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead, Greg. Hey, uh, Jim, I sent you my email address. And in 75, I bought an Apple II, one of the first Apple IIs that came out. And I learned how to program in Apple II instead of going on the PC thing. In 19 you know, I, I went with a Mac Plus when that came out because it was the only computer that had software that lets you format a book. And I had written one on the Commodore and transferred the data via modem to the Mac Plus. And oh then was able to format it with uh, Ready, Set, Go, as a matter of fact. <laughs> We're great, eventually. So before we get to Anne-Marie, I just have to tell everyone, in 1986, I, I had a Texas Instrument 990 in one of our uh, medical offices, and I had to buy a, an extra 50 megabit hard drive for it megabit 50 megabit hard drive with the spinning platters and it was forty five thousand dollars for, <laughs> for, for a used one for a used one <laughs> so there you go so there you go so i don't want to hear any crying the blues on on how much you spent i spent forty five thousand dollars so you you're ahead. complaining about 349 dollars yeah all right so Anne marie go ahead I have the story, too, because our son was about, I think, 10 or 12, and he bugged us till we bought him an Apple IIe. And we promptly burned through it because we had no idea you needed a surge protector for it. So the whole the drive oh. just promptly burned out and it cost a lot of money at the time. And then we learned that we need surge protectors. <laughs> That's oh, my and, story. Oh, and the sad part about it, oh, I'll get to tell you the follow-up. The sad part of us, PCs were just coming in and I had actually, I had a bunch of TI-990s and well over $200,000 worth of in one office of these damn things. And two years later, they were junk. We didn't use them anymore. <laughs> two years later, because PCs came along and we were using PC networks. The Novell Network, remember the Novell Networks? Oh, yeah. So we had a Novell Network set up and running PCs and, and it was a lot cheaper. And I thought, oh man, this is not good. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, um, Greg. So I had a Corvus 10 gigabytes that I paid 2,500 bucks for to put onto my Apple. And go. like you said, within about 18 months, it was obsolete. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a company down there in Monterey called Digital, and they came out with the big floppy or the big hard drives, and you could buy those things really cheap. Digital. Carl, how much money have you spent? <laughs> uh, who, who knows who keeps track, you know? That's right. <laughs> uh, I remember, I, well, my company bought uh, the first HP 35, and I think it was like, 
I don't know, $400. And then they came out with the HP 45, which had 10 memories. The first one only had one memory. But I was so enthralled with the story of the development of HP innovation to do that. It was a big article in the IEEE magazine, Spectrum. And I was just so taken back by the, the man-machine interface thought that went into, you know, use reverse Polish uh, notation. But I want to ch ask a separate question. And other Zoom sites have these, you have a chat, and they also have Q&A. What's, I don't understand why they have both. Do you, chat seems to be fine. Uh, on the Zoom, on the Zoom, you know, you have chat for a comment, but a lot of them have Q&A uh, uh, button too. Right, what's so the difference between a Q&A and chat? Um, I don't know. I have the to... Q&As are pre-recorded pre messages. We're using their AI. Or is the chat you're actually talking to somebody? Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. And I, I don't really talk to anybody. You send text. Uh, well, that's what I mean by. Yeah, but I, I was chided on a, on a, uh, another website because I was using chat to ask a question. They, and they, you know, wanted to cancel me unless I started asking questions on Q&A instead of chat. Hmm. Good question. I don't know. I don't know. I've <laughs> never... Not I've never Zoom. used the, um, you know, the Q&A on it. Well, yes, well, our Q&A is, is just an extension of the Zoom meeting. So I don't know why you would. I haven't seen Q&A at all on Zoom. Yeah. Chat, yes, Q&A. Yeah. I don't even know what it is. Not, not on this great site anyways. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> well, now, we'll be I, getting. The, I don't know. Because Zoom has other things besides just the pro version. Mm -hmm. And they could have a different type of Zoom meeting other than what we have here. And they will have other features in it. They weren't using, yeah, they weren't using the uh, webinar feature of Zoom where they, I wonder if they were using the That's webinar. probably what they were using. They were probably, yeah. Carl, they were using the webinar feature of Zoom. That's a paid, another paid service that you, another level up and you can use it as a webinar. Well, I don't want to belabor the point, but the sites I'm talking about, several of them, in fact, my Troy Library here in Michigan does it. They have both chat and Q&A in the, you know, lower bar. Yeah, I'm, yes, indeed, more more technology. Our license doesn't have the Q&A, they just have the- Yeah, I don't think, that. I don't, yeah. We have a paid version as well, so, I, you know, we've got all the features. Well, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Does anyone have a, a, a one minute question for anyone uh, here? And if not, we'll be getting going shortly. What, what's the price of gas in uh, your area, uh, doctor? You don't want to know. You don't want to <laughs> know. It's over $9 Canadian a gallon. Wow. So, so uh, it, is, uh, it is expensive. And I'm getting my e-bike out today, but it's hard to go to Costco on my e-bike and cart stuff home. That's the problem. Anyway, um, it is. Fortunately, fortunately, we don't go very far. We just stick around the house. And, you know, I go out to a couple of times a week and we just don't use much gas. But my gosh, if you're commuting to work or going out, it's, it's expensive. We filled my wife's car up two days ago. And normally it takes $40 worth of gas. It was $90. So it is, it is what it is. It's expensive. Good thing. Bowling season's over. Alice goes bowling in Albuquerque twice a week. Oh. <laughs> that doesn't restart until August. <laughs> yeah. Don't they have, um, can't you do that online? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get going. We're going to get ready to get the meeting going here. I am going to mute all. Mute all, and we'll get uh, get ready to get the meeting going.
Good morning, everyone. It's Tech for Senior. It's episode 112, and it is uh, May the 16th, a lovely day here. The, uh, the rain has finally stopped after a week of rain. The sun is out and it's a north wind blowing, which means uh, all you people in Victoria and southern Vancouver Island, we're sending you some nice weather. It is, uh, it is a, um, it's, uh, it, we, we got a 70 people in the audience today with a bunch more people over on our YouTube feed. So welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, Tech for Senior. I say this each week. Uh, I do appreciate, we all appreciate you coming. Uh, it is so important because uh, uh, we in, get our enthusiasm and our energy from uh, you coming and listening. So that's great. We have um, a lot happening this week. Uh, as you know, we have our show today, which will be uh, is broadcast not just here, but is broadcast over onto uh, YouTube. Uh, on Thursday, we will be having our um, uh, Tech for Senior Live, which is unbelievable growth in that. It's 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 amazing. Uh, and we have this week the Gadget Guy, Bill James, is going to be on this uh, this Thursday. Give Bill give a wave to everybody. He's uh, he is going to uh, uh, thrill us with some gadgets, which of course will be fun. Last week, if you haven't, you should go back and watch it because we did Google I/O was uh, which they announced a lot of new product products. We reviewed all those last Thursday, and that was a lot of fun to see all the new um, the new products that Google will be having out this uh, this 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 coming year. The new watch, the new phone, and blah, goes on and on and on. Then, of course, uh, we podcast our Thursday show, which is, uh, is, is uh, um, so you can listen to our podcast. And then uh, in another about 10 days, Huey and I have learning Chromebooks again. So uh, where's Huey? Huey, do you, where, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. You're right underneath me. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that yesterday. And I said, oh, my gosh, the months go by so fast. It was just like yesterday that we did the last one. And we have another learning Chromebook session coming up. So it is, it is uh, incredibly busy. So uh, yes, it is. So again, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to introduce everybody in a minute. However, I want to acknowledge um, Dewey Kloos. Uh, Dewey, of course, has been on the show for a couple of years now. Dewey's a, a longtime friend of mine. We met in <clears throat> Mesa, Arizona. And as you know, he is a very unique individual. In other words, he's you know, he's, he's at 88 years old to do a weekly presentation and all the stuff he does. I can only hope that I will be a fraction of Noah's fraction of, of what Dewey knows uh, when um, as, as time goes on. So uh, Dewey's going to be taking a sabbatical. You know, this is his last uh, uh, show for but he'll be he'll be here and he'll be watching and listening and so on and so forth. Um, he once told me, he said, He's a teacher all his life, and he, of course he got into the sound recording business, but he was a teacher. And he said, you know, you can never beat the teacher out of me. So but he told me that personally a number of years ago, and I, and I believe that. So I think that uh, we will be seeing, we'll be hearing more from Dewey in the, in the future as, his, um, uh, as summer comes along, and he's going to give us an update, I hope, on his uh, new bar, his barbecue and his mower and tell us all the things that he's doing. So uh, we hope we wish him well. And I know, uh, Dewey, do you want to give us a wave there? I know he's, uh, he's, he's certainly watching and we'll be listening to your, he has his final episode today. But I said, I said, we're not going to say goodbye. We're going to put you on a sabbatical so he can come back and anytime he wants and just, uh, we'll, we'll just play, play whatever you want. You, you, you have seniors rights now, uh, Dewey, you can do, uh, you can talk on anything you want and we'll tell you, you can, you can talk as long as you want. There you go. <laughs> that's a, that's a problem. That's a, that's a, there you go. So uh, he's our have, roving reporter, our roving reporter. Indeed. Indeed. <clears throat> that's is true. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so anyway, uh, I think we're the whole gang's here today. Um, Huey, have you got anything you want to say? I'm just uh, glad to be here. I woke up this morning, no dirt on top. I'm happy. You're happy. Now, Bob, of course, um, uh, Huey and I had we were talking on Saturday morning when we planned the show, and Bob hadn't got his uh, segment in yet, which is very unlike Bob. He always sends it to me by Friday. And Huey and I had a good friend of ours that 
die this week. In other words, we were watching him on the show and, and then the next day he wasn't there. And I, you know, I, I was talking to Huey, he was talking to me and we were looking at each other and said, I hope nothing's happened to Bob. <laughs> so anyway, you're here. Are you here? Are you alive? Everything's okay. Yeah, no, no, no such luck. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. And Ray. Yes. What's what's new in Pine? Live Arizona? and well in Arizona. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I've talked about before, I had these music listening clubs. There's yeah. one I'm on weekly with some buddies in Phoenix and another one I do in, in the area. I started a third one last night. Oh, and, really? Uh, it was nice. Two couples came over and we spent a couple of hours and they commented, you know, watching music videos is so much better than watching a movie together. With a movie together, you're engrossed and you, you just watch the movie. Here, there's a lot of chatter going back and forth and interaction and learning. So uh, we have a good time doing that. You know, last uh, two years ago, when my brother came over, we sat out on the deck and, and he said, you know what we do at home? And I said, what? And he said, let's go. He went and got my Sono speaker. I've got a Sono. And we sat it on the table outside. And there was about six of us. And er as you went around the table, everyone got to choose a song and you asked the sonus to play the song and and you know it went back and it's and what a fun evening that was like we listening to all the oldies and everyone had their favorite song and you just asked to play it and it played it it was pretty cool eh? yeah that, that's exactly what a music listening club is and i said very enjoyable and better than just watching a movie where everybody's quiet you mm -hmm. have opportunities for interaction that, yeah, that's last, last night we had a moon watching party it was uh here in the eastern part of the U.S., uh, we were able to see the lunar eclipse, and nice. so we were howling at the moon throughout <laughs> the evening. Hey, hey, Ray, that new Sonos uh, speaker they called Ray, yes. is, uh, it's getting a lot of publicity. Lots of, I don't know if you've been following that, but that's pretty cool. You introduced that to me last Thursday. Yeah, last Thursday. I, I haven't looked into it yet, but I will. It's getting a lot of PR. Then, of course, we have uh, Dewey. Well, Dewey, I, I know that you, do you have anything you want to say before we start your segment? Well, not particularly. I'm still here, and we'll just have to see what happens, okay? You're on sabbatical. You can come back anytime you want. All right? Okie dokie. Okay. And Bill James, yeah, your you Chromebook died. Talking. You killed your Chromebook, but I know you did that on purpose so you could buy a new one. Well, not not really, but I, <laughs> I, think, it's, I think it's gone. But speaking of music, uh, here... Um, I've gone to what they refer to as Singo. It's a play on bingo, except it's musical. And they play musical tunes, and you use your uh, phone. Um, Saham, I think is what it's called. Shirts, and it identifies the music, and you just mark the box. That's mm -hmm. a lot of fun, too. I think that could be applied to your home, to a home game as well. There you go. Yeah, there's, there's two programs like that on your phone. Shazam is one. Soundhound is the other. Mm -hmm. Sound down. I was trying to think of that name last night. Thank you for that. Yeah. So we uh, there's a, a lot of um, 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 bars and um, restaurants that are doing that for uh, as entertainment. Singo, S-I-N-G-O. I'll look into that. All right. Uh, just before we get going with Bob's segment, I want to thank uh, Carl Kalinda for his very generous donation to our coffee fund, and also Elaine Larson. Thank you both for your uh, for your donation. It it helps us pay the bills. Thanks so much, Bob. Are you ready to roll? I hope so. <laughs> Let's make sure. Let's see. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending May 13th, 2022. If you find the video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and get involved. Costa Rica declares national emergency over ransomware. In one of its first official acts, Costa Rica new president Rodrigo Chavez declared a national emergency saying that the country is suffering from cyber criminals and cyber terrorists. The Russian-based Conti ransomware gang claimed responsibility for ongoing attacks through April on the Costa Rican Finance Ministry, Labor Ministry, and Social Services Agency, 
Last week, the U.S. State Department offered a $10 million reward for information leading to the identification or location of Conti leaders. The attacks began during the previous president's final months in office. For more on this story, see The Guardian. Ukrainian sent to prison for making over $80,000 with stolen passwords. Glib Oleksandr Ivanov Tolpintsev was sentenced to four years in federal prison for decrypting the credentials of thousands of computers worldwide and selling them on the dark web. He was also ordered to pay back illegally made profits over $82,000. In 2020, Polish authorities took Ivanov Tolpintsev into custody and extradited him to the U.S. In February of 2022, he pled guilty to selling usernames, passwords, and personally identifiable information, including dates of birth and social security numbers of the U.S. residents on the dark web. Read more at Cyber News. Starlink fighting for Ukraine on the cyber front. Starlink has been helping tens of thousands of Ukrainian citizens stay connected to the Internet during what political scientists call the biggest war in Europe since World War II. In Ukraine, the technology is crucial, with over 150,000 daily users relying on the service to stay online during the war. Since the beginning of the invasion, the Starlink app climbed to the top place among all downloads in Ukraine. Thousands of Starlink terminals were reportedly delivered to Ukraine after the country's vice prime minister expressed concerns that Russia's aggression may disrupt the country's internet connection. See Cyber News for more on this story. Hackers exploit Roblox's scripting engine to install Trojan. Hackers exploit a scripting engine used by Roblox to insert a Trojan file that can break applications, corrupt or remove data, and send information to malicious actors. Cybercriminals continue targeting Roblox, one of the most popular game systems globally, with over 50 million daily users. In April 2021, the Cyber News team investigation found that Roblox app on Android appears to have numerous potential security issues under the hood that could put the platform and its players at risk. Trojans like this can break applications, corrupt or remove data, and send information to the hacker, the company noted. See the whole story at Cyber News. U.S. Court Jails Crooks for Online Identity Fraud Three men have been imprisoned for stealing the credentials of tens of thousands of victims and using these to fraudulently obtain credit and tax rebates on a massive scale. The Department of Justice announced the illicit earnings of the scam, which also involved claiming on falsified tax returns and paying fake vendor accounts opened by Joven, ran to nearly $500,000 seized in cash at Duryov's home in August 2020 by the FBI, along with the personal information of the victims and a stash of credit cards set up in their names. Today's sentencing now holds them accountable for their crimes and should serve as a warning to others involved in this parasitic behavior, said David Walker, an IRS spokesperson. See more at Cyber News. A century-old university shuts down over ransomware attack. While Lincoln College, a liberal arts school, faced many difficulties, Cybercrime was the final nail in the organization's coffin. Established in 1865, survived many challenges. The economic crisis of 1887, a major campus fire in 1912, the Spanish flu of 1918, the Great Depression, World War II, and the 2008 global financial crisis. A message of the school's website claims that Lincoln College suffered from a cyber attack last December. The incident thwarted admission activities and hindered access to institutional data. 
Lincoln College has been serving students from across the globe for more than 157 years. The loss of history, careers, and community of students and alumni is immense, said David Garlick, president of Lincoln College. See the whole story at Cyber News. Twitter's CEO posted, we need to be prepared for all scenarios. Agarwal responded after Musk puts deal temporarily on hold. Twitter CEO Harag Agarwal acknowledged the possibility that Elon Musk's deal to purchase the company could fall through in a series of tweets this afternoon that sought to explain why he's shaking up Twitter's leadership. Agarwal said that he's still accountable for leading and operating Twitter for the time being and that his recent changes are meant to build a stronger Twitter and help manage costs. While I expect the deal to close, we need to be prepared for all scenarios and always do what's right for Twitter, Agarwal said. Read the full story on The Verge. Google's I.O. revealed new security features, including virtual credit cards, account safety status. Google is working on a new virtual card tool that can be used across Android devices and in the Chrome browser on Mac or PC. It's separate from Google Pay, and once a card is added to the service, a virtual card number will be given to the vendor whenever you purchase something online. In the event of a data breach, the virtual card number can be replaced and you won't have to deal with replacing your physical card. Apple has had the same type of feature for the Apple Card. Google's virtual card are expected to launch this summer. Google also announced a new tool for users' profiles that will alert you if there's an action or step you need to take to better protect your information. The account safety status will show up as a yellow circle around your profile's avatar, letting you know there's something that needs your attention. See more details at ZDNet. This week's must-read on the Avast blog. Listen to Gary Kasparov talk with Avast CISO Jayap Balu on how private sector cybersecurity and cryptocurrencies will shape the future of privacy. Read the article at the link listed below. And that wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. So now you know why it didn't get to you on Friday. Unmute myself. Yes, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Bob. Wow, lots of information, eh? I'm going to set up uh, my Google Pay on my watch this week. So that's my that's my challenge this week to do. And I'm going to I want to go to the store and actually pay. I'm going to take my video camera and, and video my first payment with my Google Pay. <laughs> so we'll see how that works out. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's get on. Uh, we've got uh, Dewey's final segment on on EV cars. I wonder if he's going to buy one. I wonder what's uh, anyway. We'll see what he has to say. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dewey, and my Tech Talk topic for today is EV batteries, a cutting-edge technology challenge. Last week's Tech Talk covered the pros and cons of electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and hybrid electric vehicles. I was finishing out writing this Tech Talk when I came across a radio interview with Joanne Muller, transportation specialist at Axios.com, who was saying, EV batteries are the new oil and the U.S. is lagging behind Europe and China in the race to make them. She went on to say that the historic shift to electric vehicles will give the U.S. a fresh chance to achieve energy independence, but it will require complex strategic moves that won't pay off for years. There wasn't sufficient time last week to explore the entire article, so I suggested that I might cover it this week. 
According to Joanne Muller, the big picture is that most of today's advanced batteries, both for powering cars as well as storing clean energy, are sourced in Asia. Demand for batteries will skyrocket in the coming decades, and if the U.S. wants to control its own energy destiny, it will need a secure and resilient supply chain for critical materials and other components needed to make these batteries. If we don't do this, if we don't as a country invest in our supply chain, it will go to the lowest cost country, which is China, says Mike of a battery recycling company. Joanne Muller goes on to note Biden wants half of all vehicles sold in the U.S. to be electric by 2030. The U.S. has only about 5% of the manufacturing capacity needed to hit that target. At the same time, other countries are setting equally aggressive EV battery goals, thus driving up prices for lithium, nickel, and other essential materials for manufacture. In March, Biden invoked the Cold War era Defense Production Act to encourage domestic mining, processing, and recycling of critical materials such as, of course, lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, and manganese. Also, the U.S. government has given several foreign company incentives to build up refining and manufacturing capacity here in the U.S. Meanwhile, some U.S. car makers are scrambling to build their own battery plants to guarantee supplies for upcoming electric vehicles. This is a direct government action into building a heavy industry from scratch, the stuff of President's past, said Simon Moores, CEO of a London-based benchmark mineral intelligence. There is still a gaping hole in America's efforts, said J.B. Straubel, a Tesla co-founder, who is now the CEO of the battery component company Redwood Materials. Redwood plans to invest more than $2 billion to start building anodes in the U.S. later this year and start building cathodes by 2024. Joanne Muller's article did not include an explanation of why anodes and cathodes are apparently important components in electric vehicle battery technology, so consequently, I decided to check into what part they play, and here's what I learned. Lithium-ion batteries comprise four main parts, one the cathode, and two the anode that store the lithium, three the electrolyte that carries lithium ions between the anode and cathode, and four the separator a thin plastic filter that physically separates the anode and cathode, only allowing ions to pass through. When they're discharging, lithium ions move from the carbon-based anode, that's the negative electrode, through the electrolyte, an organic compound consisting of lithium salts, to the cathode, again the positive electrode, which produces energy in the form of electricity to power the EV. When charging the battery, the process is simply reversed. As I studied this process, I came across an article by Pearl Liu at www.scmp.com. That's <clears throat> the South China Morning Post. It had a different perspective on EV batteries and why they sometimes may catch fire. Now, I knew that lithium batteries in phones and other small devices had a bad reputation for fires. I think Ron even had a fire in his. They're also, but are they also dangerous in electric vehicles? Well, Pearl Liu first makes two important points. The electrolyte used in today's lithium ion tends to be volatile and flammable at high temperatures. Two, a number of car makers, including Toyota, Toyota are researching the use of solid state electrolytes instead of liquid electrolytes to solve the problem. And that's Pearl the U at the lower right. A lithium ion battery's capacity and voltage is determined by the lithium based metal used for its cathode. Again, that's the positive electrode, which releases electrons in the battery powering process, as you just heard. Electric vehicle battery types are usually named for their primary components. 
And there are th currently three major types of lithium ion batteries, and I believe she means manufactured in China, that are used to power, power today's electric vehicles. One, NCM, in which the cathode, in addition to lithium, is composed of nickel, cobalt, and manganese. Two, LFP, made up of lithium, iron, and phosphate. And three, NCA, consisting of nickel, cobalt, and aluminum. I also learned, but not from Pearl Liu, that General Motors is teaming with South Korea's LG Chem to provide high-tech EV batteries that use less cobalt, which makes cells one-third less expensive and also last longer, in fact, much longer, like up to maybe 600 miles. No mention was made, however, of fire safety, and I begin to wonder how safe different types of electric vehicles are. I found an answer in the following story. Just last Friday, three days ago, May 13th, AutoInsuranceEZ.com updated a previously published story titled Gas Versus Electric Vehicles 2022 Findings. To find the rate of car fires by vehicle type, the authors collected the latest data on car fires from the National Transportation Safety Board and also calculated the rate of fires from sales data by the BTS, which is the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Hybrid EVs, that's plug-in hybrid EVs and hybrid EVs that have both a gas engine and a battery pack, had 3,475 fires per 100,000 sales and scored the worst. Now, gasoline-only powered vehicles rank second with 1,530 files per 100,000 vehicles sold. And listen to this. Fully electric vehicles, EVs, scored the best with just 25.1 fires per 100,000 vehicles sold. Well, based on this data, Fully electric vehicles like Tesla and Polestar and others don't catch fire nearly as much as claimed in the news. Though EVs are pricier, you're way less likely to burn or burn up in what? Well, that's my Tech Talk story for today. And I am sticking with it. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and so long. Well done. Well done. I didn't, uh, that's amazing statistics, Dewey. That's uh, that fully, fully, full EVs uh, uh, have such a low incidence of fires. That's amazing, eh? I think it's very amazing. Yeah, that's a statistic. I ended up getting one, who knows? I know, you're talking a lot about it. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, maybe the old caddy's going to go and, you know, something's going to, something's going to happen here. But anyway, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure you'll keep us posted. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I'm gonna move ahead. Um, we're gonna hold questions until the, of course, with the question and answer. I'm gonna move ahead now uh, with my segment and we'll uh, come over here. And this is actually a follow-up on the email uh, segment that we did uh, last week. Are you a senior that is having trouble understanding their email? Well, today in this video, I'm going to teach you three concepts that will make you a pro. Mary has come into our tech department with a problem looking at Google Photos. She has taken a number of photos on her Samsung phone and has uploaded these to Google Photos. She has brought her laptop in, but these pictures are not on Google Photos on the laptop. Her complaint to you in our tech department is the phone is not syncing to the laptop. How would you manage this? And let me show you how easy this is after you understand these three concepts I'm going to talk about today. Well, I'm Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. At Tech for Senior, we make videos to help seniors understand technology. If you want to be kept 
up to date as new videos come out, be sure and click the subscribe and notification bell below. And then we'll send you a personal notification when we release new videos. Now let's get on with understanding these three concepts regarding email. Now the first thing you need to know is what the name of your Google account is and its password. This is so important. The name of your Google account is set up originally when you created the account and it cannot be changed. This is the name that you will always use. You've probably forgotten about that now because it's a long time since you set this up. When you created it, it probably was created as you were accessing a service with Google or else when you had your first Android phone. And in most cases, it's best to have only one Google account, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And you must know the name and the password of your account. This is so important. It is a lifelong account that you'll use as you purchase new Android phones or you connect a Chromebook or other service to your Google account. So please know this and don't forget it. Now the name on your Google account is usually your Gmail address, but not necessarily. When you set your account up, there is an option to choose another name, so it may not always be your Gmail address. Once set up, you cannot change your account name. Now most of you identify a Google email address as at gmail.com. This is not entirely true. Recently we saw a big telco company, telus.net, in Canada. They got rid of their email service to Gmail. You actually kept your same email address, so it could be 123456 at telus.net, and that now is a Gmail account. So your Gmail account does not always show at gmail.com. So let's have a look and see what you get with your Google account. Well, with your Google account, you get Google Drive, and this is 15 gigabytes of cloud storage. Now within that, you get some software. For all of those who are paying for Office 365, you get Google's version for free. Google Docs is a document processing. Google Sheets is a spreadsheet. And of course, Google Slides is like PowerPoint at presentation software. This software is free and it comes on your Google Drive. You have Gmail, Google Photos, Google Calendar, Google Contact, Google Groups, Google Maps, and Google Sites, which is a web building software and what we use for Tech for Seniors website. If you've been there, you'll see that was built with Google Sites, Google Chat, and you also have the abilities to start a YouTube channel. Plus, there's about 20 or 30 more services associated with your Google account that I'm not going to list today or would be here too long. All this is part of your Google account. So Sally is a retired teacher who you're seeing in our tech department. She tells you the following. She doesn't trust Google. She has an iPhone and an iPad. She uses Apple email service or iCloud Mail, and she tells you she's never had a Google account. In further discussion with you, she does use Google Photos because her friends do. What would you tell Sally, and why would it be important? Well, now that you know what a Google account is, you understand that Google Photos is part of a Google account. So if Sally did create Google Photos, she had to create a Google account. You can't have part of the service. It's sort of all or none. So Sally does have a Google account. Now, why would this be important? Well, she needs to know the name and password of that because if she ever decides to get an Android phone, then she will need a, her username and password to get all her Google Photos in the account. Well, you see Larry, the retired accountant who comes to our tech department. He tells you that he doesn't use Google. 
He only has Office 365 and he has an iPhone for his mobile data. He tells you though that he's going to purchase a Samsung S22. What should you tell Larry? Well, as you know, Larry is going to have to establish a Google account with his Android phone. The first thing he'll be asked to do as he sets up his S22 is to put in his Google username and password. The important thing here is I don't believe that Larry has gone all through his life without having a Google account. He probably has a Google account in the past and it's important that he tries to remember what that is with his Google name and password because his data will be in there. Very likely he probably has some Google Photos or some services that he's used in the past. If he knows what that is, then he'll be able to access that through his new phone. Now the second point I'd like to make is it's generally a good idea to just have one email address associated with one Google account. This keeps things simpler and certainly when you're dealing with mobile issues, causes a lot less confusion. Let's look at Mary's problem that we discussed at the beginning. Mary, in fact, came to Silver Ridge Resort and saw us in our tech department to solve this problem. She was only there for a month, as she told me, as she just got assigned as the secretary to her church. She told me while she was in Mesa, she continued to look at the church's Gmail account and was able to uh, get ready for her job when she returned. She was sending out Gmail through the church's Gmail account. In fact, what Mary had been doing when she was taking pictures around Silveridge, they were being uploaded into the church's Google Photos account. In fact, we saw her last, the last secretary and the secretary before us pictures in the church's Google account. Mary said to me, well, the church does not have a Google Photos account. Again, she doesn't understand that once you have a Gmail account, you have a Google account and associated with that is a Google Photos account. So the problem was Mary's photos were going into the wrong account, which is common when you are switching accounts on a mobile device. So the third concept that you need to know is do not share your email address. Sharing an email address like Mary and John do is really not a good idea. To have an email address like Mary and John at gmail.com and share this creates all sorts of problems. It makes security very difficult and two-factor authentication almost impossible. You really should have one Google account and one phone. As your health changes in the future, you may need to limit access to certain accounts, such as your bank account. This becomes very difficult with a shared account. So please, each one of you needs to have their own Google account and their own email address with their own cell phone. So it's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. The three concepts you need to know. Know the name of your Google account and the password. Try and only have one email account with your Google account and don't share your email address. Till we see you again, have a great day. <laughs> All right, um, thank you um, for, anyway, we, um, I put in the chat a article, an excellent article written by um, Mike McAvoy on multiple Google email addresses with one uh, Gmail account. So it is possible, but uh, I'd like you to, if you are considering that, uh, you should read this article. It's a very, very good article. I'm also going to put it in our newsletter tomorrow. Um, so um, if you, there may be some questions about this and we can certainly ask them. You can certainly ask those in the, uh, in the Q and A. Uh, Huey, are you ready to roll? I am. And I'm even not muted. There you go. Wonders never cease. Yeah. Find my video here. And, uh, screen.
How to transfer files from Android to PC. I'm Huey Poplock. Do you need to learn how to transfer files from an Android phone to a PC? It's easy with the right tricks. You have a photo on your Android phone or tablet and you need to get it to your PC. How do you do this? Perhaps you resort to emailing the photo or file. You can upload photos to Google Photos and then download them to your PC. That's the way I've been doing it for years. As it turns out, you have several options, such as a USB cable, Bluetooth, and CloudSync. And alternatively, you might use an app like AirDroid or PushBullet. Put simply, transferring files from Android to a Windows PC isn't difficult. I'm going to talk about two ways to help you copy files from your Android phone to your PC, Bluetooth and using a USB cable. Let's get started. Here is my PC desktop. You'll notice on the left is my Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. It is connected to my PC via Bluetooth. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate how to make that connection happen. If you have issues with it, you'll see at the bottom a link to an article that will help you make that connection. What you want to do is make sure by swiping down that here at the top, Bluetooth is turned on. Swipe back up and now we're going to come down here and Look here, and you want to make sure the, the Bluetooth is turned on on your PC. Another way to do it is to go to your settings, go to Bluetooth and devices, and make sure your Bluetooth is turned on. And then you want to make sure what, it's, what the name of the device is as it's seen by Bluetooth. And you want to make sure your phone is connected. Now that we know that they are connected, Let's go ahead and close out the settings. We want to take a photo that we recently snapped on our phone and make a copy on our PC and do it very quickly and easily. The first way we're going to do that is with Bluetooth. Let's take a look at what we do. What we're going to do is come down here to the lower right. We're going to go to the Bluetooth and hold our mouse over it and click it and we're going to tell it we want to receive a file it's now waiting for that file now we're going to uh, go to our gallery which is right here on page two we'll click on the gallery we're going to take this picture and we want to come down here to where it says share that's the share sign you click on it, you're going to share to Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth may not be on this line. You may have to go over and slide across. This is what I had to do to get it there and go to more and click on more and then you will see the Bluetooth there. If, it's, if, it's, if you don't see it in this line, and it could be anywhere is on the line, but because it was the last one I, I checked or the last one I used, it's showing up right here so when i click this it says okay what device you'll see that it's waiting to do something check to make sure the connection device is visible to other devices we're going to click on the desktop we click on it you can see the transfer is starting then it wants to know where do you want that it's transferred it but it's putting it it's temporary. You can move it to wherever you want. Let's go ahead and we're going to go to uh, this PC, Documents, down to Tech for Senior, and to today's date. And then we're going to say OK, and then Finish. Now, if we look in that folder, and I already have it set up so I can look right at the folder, there is the file. If I click on it, and open it, there's the picture. And right now it's at 30%, it's a huge picture. 
It is 4,000 by 3,000 uh, pixels. So it's a big picture. I can, you know, blow it up. I can go, go in. I can do whatever I need to do. It's on my PC. So now I can do whatever I need to do for it. And it's available for me. You can do this with any file. And it's very simple, very quick, very easy to make the transfer from your phone to your PC. Next, we're going to take a cable. We're going to plug it into the USB port on our computer. And it asks us, do we want to allow access to the phone data? And we're definitely going to say yes, allow it. So now when we open up this PC, or if you open up File Explorer, you can see that we have the Ultra connected. So if we double click this, you see that it shows uh, the same as an external drive would show. You see the device and then we click it again and we see all of the folders that are on the S22 Ultra. We're going to go to DCIM, which are the pictures that we take. We'll click on that and we're going to go to the camera. It took several seconds to load everything. We have almost 2,400 photos on our phone in that folder. So we're going to have to come down here to the bottom. Make sure we got it all here. We'll come all the way down to the bottom because it's sorted by date. I click this and take everything by holding the shift key down and clicking here. We will highlight all of the pictures we're going to take or to to copy to the PC. We're going to come down here to Documents. We're going to come down to Tech for Senior. And then we're just going to right mouse click, move over to the date. We're going to say Copy here. It takes a few seconds. And if we now go to that folder, and there are all of the pictures we just copied, including a, an MP4, you can see. So let's just open any one of them on the PC. Again, it's a 4,000 by 3,000 pixel picture. We can edit it. We can do whatever we want because it's on the PC now. We're not, it's not going to involve the phone at all. We've made the transfer from the phone to the PC. I don't want to leave my iPhone friends out, so we're going to take my iPhone 8. We're going to plug it into the computer using a USB cable. And when I do, I get a notice asking if I would allow it. As soon as I do, it shows up in this PC. When I click on it, I'm seeing the internal storage, similar to what I saw on my Android phone. And when I click on it, it only shows the DCIM, which is the photos. They're in folders. I'm going to take something from last month that's by date. It's 2020-2204. I'm going to just take a particular picture. Uh, let's take this. Don't even not even sure what it is. We're going to go to uh, here and we're going to come down to and we're going to slide it into the same folder where we saved all of the pictures from the Android. And now we'll click on the Android folder and we will see the image 0567 that we just copied. And if we open that picture up, that picture is now on the PC, ready to be edited. So it's very quick and easy to move pictures from your iPhone to your PC via cable without having to upload to Google Photos or any other cloud storage and then download them. You can do it directly with a USB cable that connects to your iPhone. Transferring your files from an Android to a PC. I'm Huey Poplock. 
There you go. You're muted, Ron. I'm just unmuting myself. I got to find the button. Thanks. Thanks, Huey. That's great. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you, but I'm going to save those for okay. the Q&A. Uh, just before we get into uh, Ray's uh, uh, final music outro, I want to just remind everyone that we do have a premiere service uh, going on today that will be, of course, half past the hour. I put the uh, link in the chat. Uh, we also have, uh, it also went out in our uh, newsletter. If you haven't subscribed to the newsletter, you should do so. But the link is uh, is in the chat. Today, uh, I'm gonna be talking on, you know, we have just under 600 videos uh, with Tech for Senior. And uh, it, it's a big, it's sort of a big production now and organizing and navigating your way around can be a bit difficult. So, um, so I have a video out that I did a, about a year ago on organizing Tech for Senior, which we'll be playing today. Um, Dewey's going to talk on hearing aids. He says, uh, what did you say? And he's going to tell us all about, about hearing aids. And Huey's going to talk on the Chromebook keyboard. Uh, Chromebook's keyboard. The Chromebook keyboard is a little bit different than PC. So he goes through some of the, the differences of a Chromebook keyboard. This will is a free service. It uh, will be starting at... Uh, half past the hour um, at, uh, at our, on our YouTube channel at that link that I gave everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone over on our YouTube uh, service for coming today. Uh, if you want to hop over, we've got 73. We've got lots of room for you. If you want to hop over here and participate uh, in the Q&A, you're most welcome to do so. Uh, we'll do that. We're going to stop our YouTube feed now as Ray gets ready to go with our music segment. So take